what inspired you to write and teach about grief? You know, destiny is an interesting concept. And I'm going to start by saying um, when I was in my 20s, mid 20s, and I was um, doing my master's in counseling psychology in the UK at Durham University, Northern England, I wanted to figure out, Eileen, how do people recover from losing the love of their lives, their their partners in life, their brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, best friends. How I love people so much and I couldn't imagine, I could not imagine ever recovering from something like this. And at the time, my professor said, you, <laughs> you're too happy to, to study <laughs> such, a, such a topic. And I said, I just, I just, need to understand this better. And so I wrote my thesis uh, on the stages of bereavement at the time. What mm-hmm. I didn't know then was that my own very young husband was going to be diagnosed with stage four colon cancer when he was 31 years old. And we had two babies. Um, and Eileen, I was not just devastated. I didn't, I didn't think I could, I could make it through. And I, and I knew all about grief. I knew everything professionally, right? I, uh, mm-hmm. I even facilitated support groups here in, uh, in the U.S. that we, we moved first to Houston, Texas. That was our first stop. And, um, and I spent time with the dying. I, I volunteered at the hospice and I would go and sit with the dying so their families could go and have a shower. Like I was fascinated by death and how we get through it before anything happened to me. So when the love of my life was told that he had a terminal, it was stage four, a terminal disease, I uh, wished it was me instead of him. I realized that I knew nothing, that my studies were nowhere near enough to understand anything that came to something so tragic. And I promised myself that Whenever I made it back to living fully, if, if ever, I would go back and get everyone else who's struggling with the same thing. And I always feel emotional when I share this, this part of the story. And it's a long time ago now, but I was determined and it was very hard. Uh, he fought for about uh, three and a half years. We tried everything to save his life and um, he passed away. And I was a single mom, uh, running away from my profession. I did not want to, um, ever, ever, (laughs) you know, study or be a counselor of grief. I, I, I didn't think I was equipped anymore. Right. I didn't think I could, I could, I could do it. I didn't know. I didn't think I knew anything. Um, and I was grieving deeply. So about four years went by, um, and I started to get my life back together I was working in the corporate world um, and resigned when I was ready, just literally resigned. Oh, so you took a job completely different from what you studied, in HR. right? Because you're like, I can't, I can't work in this field. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something, and I went. I also went back to school uh, for another postgraduate degree in human resource management at Northeastern University, and. Um, and I said, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I need health insurance for my kids. <laughs> I was in survival mode, right? I, and we'll talk about that. I, I need this. I need that. I need the other thing. And, and, and I was determined, but then I started to feel better. I started to understand things better and resigned and started. And for anyone who's listening, who wants to write or wants to start something and they, they have no idea what they're doing, that's okay. It's, it's exactly what you should be, you should be doing. Um, so I started writing just a few sentences uh, on, on Facebook. Uh, and Facebook was kind of new at the time. I uh, started a page and it just grew so much. It grew so much, so quickly. And then I developed, started to develop the life reentry model, which now it's like 14 years old um, and um. started running classes. We started with 22 people, the very first groups. Um, and our biggest where it was like 250 people from all over the world doing the class with me. Um, I learned so much about 
um, loss. And that is when around 2014, 15, I started seeing something else beyond tragic grief. And that's when I made my, my first discovery that, um, we don't get stuck or we don't stop living only because we are experiencing something tragic, but there's another loss that's hidden, almost like a phantom loss, like a ghost, something that was completely invisible and why I named it invisible loss. And people got stuck in what I call the waiting room, which is the place we go after something bad happens. And we're not supposed to stay there, Eileen, for a long time. We're supposed to like kind of get better and, 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 and get out of it. But we actually um, stay there for some people for the rest of our lives. And the losses that put us there, most people don't realize are something so much smaller, actually very catastrophic, but we don't consider them significant or important and why we are stuck sometimes and we don't know why. So book three, <laughs> and this is the last book I'm ever going to write about grief, by the way. <laughs> okay. This is it. This is the end. This is my, I feel like this. Like a trilogy, right? Of grief. <laughs> <laughs> this is a trilogy. This book the is going to. The end of the trilogy. To, yes. It's going to really, hopefully, change the way we look at grief uh, in our world and uh, validate uh, the stories of our lives and, and, and uh, create witnesses for what I call moments of impact, that they're not like tragic big losses, that they are unacknowledged moments of rejection, being left behind, being isolated, being uh, abandoned by someone, the more public rejection it is, the harder the moment of impact is and the the longer the stay in the waiting room. So I believe we grieve what I, w the way I say it is the original self, the self, Eileen, that we leave behind to to survive something. We actually doubt ourselves after that moment of impact we question who we are and we don't believe in our abilities and our skills anymore. So we, we are too afraid to try something new, to go after our dreams. And that's where a lot of people stay in, in that place in between thinking that's their new life and kind of accept a second level of life. They, they accept a less of a life for themselves. Yeah, you're saying like some sort of fear or something is holding them back from from that. Yes. And doubt of doubting them themselves because they were rejected, they were abandoned, they were uh, discarded, uh, whether it's from parents, boyfriends, girlfriends, relationships, your teacher at school. Over the years, over the last 14 years, having witnessed these public cleanses that we do, we do this public within the group where we... We share exactly what's on our minds. I witnessed some of the most incredible invisible losses that stem from the public education system. For example, when you are in school, mm -hmm. in class, in college, in high school, and you feel embarrassed and ashamed for something you don't know or you don't understand. Um, we, don't, we don't have nurturing environments. Yeah, like there's no process to, to help us move through those 